you chose to come down from your throne and to be able to come as a most fragile form to die a most horrific death so that you could have a relationship with us, Lord. So all we do is we just stand in awe of your presence. We just stand in awe of your authority, but ultimately just of your grace that you brought us in, Lord. So Lord, we just declare your name high in this place. We declare your name high over our lives, over our families, over our careers, because you are worthy. Not because of nothing that we have done, but because of who you are and what you have done, Lord. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. In your precious name we pray, amen. Thank you so much, worship team. Good morning, welcome. Do you want to turn before you sit and greet somebody around you, learn a new name? Good morning, Northridge. Good morning. We are so glad you are here uh, and decided to join us this morning. As we transition from a time of kind of vocal worship, we're going to transition to a time of giving and another type of worship. And so if our ushers want to come forward with our little plates, um, I just want to kind of reiterate, you may notice we've started passing out these plates kind of more recently. And uh, this is by no means ever a form of guilt of like this massive black hole that you need to input in in order, you know, concert ticket to come here. Uh, but this is just another form of worship. We believe that uh, we worship not just with our voices, not with our words, but with our actions. And if Northridge is someplace that you call home and you want to buy in, just like we serve, uh, we worship, we, we give. And this is something that we're called to. And so uh, you're by no means obligated, um, but we would love if you give your tithe offerings either in the offering plates or online uh, through e-transfer or automatic with withdrawal. So uh, let's just pray and bow our heads as we pray for our offering today. Heavenly Father, uh, we are just in awe of what you are doing in this place, what you're doing in the lives of your people. Um, and we just turn our attention and our gaze back to you this morning. Uh, may we just quiet our hearts um, from this week, from the worries, from the stresses, um, and just focus our eyes solely on you. Uh, may every offering today, no matter big or small, uh, may just be glorify you and to orient ourselves um, with you and number one on our throne of our lives, Lord. So we thank you. Uh, and we just, may you multiply these in ways that we can not only imagine, um, but may you, your work be done today, Lord. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Awesome. All right. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a Sunday where we have more announcements uh, than today. So if you have a notebook, get notes of David's sermon uh, announcements. That's what we're doing today. Uh, so starting off today, uh, tonight, in fact, we are having our four square worship night. This is all. Oh, I, I am so excited. I've gotten a glimpse of this set list. Uh, our very own Carissa Kennedy is going to be leading worship. So if you have no other reason, come and support Carissa uh, in new ways. And it's, it's just going to be amazing. Derek Sanderson from Riverside speaking. And there's just something incredible about joining together and realizing we are not just a small body, but part of a larger body across uh, lower mainland and B.C. So that is happening at Northside in Coquitlam at 6.30 tonight. So I would show up early. It's going to be busy. There's only so much space. Uh, so I would get a front row seat for this uh, an amazing event, just seeing how God's going to work. It's going to be awesome. All right. For that, um, we also have this coming Thursday. We have our launching of our Next Steps program, which means we have our uh, Bible study, which is going to be happening, which is amazing to be run by Stephen Roxanne Murdoch starting at 630. And then right across in the room, we have our uh, Next Steps program that's going to be running kind of just what does it mean to be a member of Northridge? What does it mean to be a member of Foursquare? And what is this all about? And so if you're interested in that, uh, David Buzz is going to be running that at 630 as well in here. So Thursday, 630. If you have nothing else to do, we got something for you here. So show up and we are excited for that. Then we, man, we got something like every day this week. Friday is Good Friday. 
So we're going to be having multiple services. We're joining together with churches of uh, not just Foursquare, but of Maple Ridge uh, at one of our three locations, either the Alliance Church, either at St. George's or at Highway Church. It's going to be an awesome time of just gathering together and just uh, reveling in the cross and the amazing sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So one of those three locations. And then Easter Sunday, 10 a.m., we are meeting here together together. Uh, I don't know about you, but if there's ever a Sunday that I look forward to, it's Easter Sunday because it's this massive whew, amazingness of just seeing what God has risen and he has done. Um, an amazing opportunity to invite others as well. And so uh, we're expecting this place to be packed. Uh, it's going to be awesome. And so if you want to invite anyone out to that, that is happening 10 a.m. next Sunday. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, Kids Camp. If you are a child, uh, we have so many things happening for you. Uh, or if you're a parent with children, you really want to listen up, because we know the children aren't listening. Uh, first thing, they're sort of listening. They're in back there. They're, anyways. Uh, kids Camp Rally. <laughs> Told you there's a lot now, so there's so much going through my mind. Uh, kids Camp Rally is happening on April 15th. This is going to be hosted by our very own church, all the four square churches. Uh, we're going to be kind of, you know, reminding ourselves what camp is all about and kind of launching our registration. So this is happening right here, 1.30 to 4 p.m., April 15th. And then the next day is going to be our launching of our uh, registration for Kids Camp. So registration for Kids Camp starts on April 16th on the Monday after our event that's hosted by Northridge. We're going to be welcoming all the different churches here to have an amazing uh, time together of just rallying and getting excited for what God's going to do uh, in the months leading up to, as well as at Kids Camp happening at the end of August. So that is happening, but if you can't wait for that, uh, there is something happening on April 12th, which is our Kids Night Out event. This is for kids K to grade 6, and it's going to be an Easter edition, so lots of fun activities and a great night to invite kids who have never been to church uh, for fun, snacks, and a great message and very interactive. So don't miss out. You do need to sign up and pre-register for that on our website, so nrchurch.ca. Uh, you can sign up for a Kids Night Out registration. All right. Now, I asked my students this. Does anybody want me to repeat an announcement? Because I know you probably didn't catch all that. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, talk to either Tawny or David or visit our website at nrchurch.ca, and we're happy to get you connected. Last thing, uh, next Easter, uh, sorry, next week for our Easter service, we're looking for a couple more people um, who have an amazing, powerful testimony that you would love to share out. Um, it's cool to kind of hear about some of the different stories that are coming out through this, but if you have any uh, powerful testimony that you want to share, uh, just connect with Chris and she can get you in, in on the inside of knowing what's happening on our Easter service. So, uh, all right, that's all the announcements I have. Uh, if you are in 5 to 12, you guys can head off to your services right now, and the rest of us can welcome up David Bezna. Thank you, Matt. Well done. Um, as the children children go, we're going to pray for the children. Um, we've had we've been working through, and again, I see a lot of new faces again today. So I want to reiterate what we've been doing is we have joined with uh, churches across the city to um, follow these prayer initiatives. And uh, so these are generated by actually Murray Mormon. Many of you know he's not a Mormon. He is, his last name is Mormon. And uh, he heads up our Prairie Ridge Meadows ministry. And he's the one who's kind of come up with these prayer prompts, which are going out via social media. And uh, churches across the city are praying for these things today in their Sunday morning services or their weekend services. So today we're going to be praying for our children. And when I say our children, there's something about being a part of this community or be, being a part of a church community that uh, there's an adoptive nature. Uh, I don't know how many of you have started to get to know the usual suspects in the halls, the ones who go for a third and fourth cookie. They're probably related to me. Um, but the, the kids of this church are, are kids that we kind of, we can pray for in this moment as well. All right? So even if you don't have children of your own, be considering the kids in our congregation, the kids in our community, maybe the kids at the, ch at the, at the school that's meeting just down the street from your house. And we're going to pray together. Now, we've actually talked about this as a staff. One of the problems with the way we've prayed in the past is that um, I'm going to ask you to stand where you're at and pray out loud. If, if you believe that you've got a, a prayer to share, prayer for the kids, um, you can stand where you're at and pray out loud. Now, we had talked about doing the roving microphone thing, but you know what? I think, A, uh, the reason we do that is for you online is I know you're going to miss some of the live uh, prayer in the room here. But um, 
let's reserve this for an in-person perk. So people at home, you can pray along with us, but you're not going to get to experience the fullness of what's happening in here. So I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to lead us off in prayer, and then I'm going to leave some silence where you can pray either uh, with the person next to you, or you can pray on your own. You can pray out loud, or you can pray to yourself. And if, if you believe you've got a word that you want to pray out, just stand where you're at and try to speak loudly enough that we can all be encouraged by your prayer. Does that make sense? So we're going to take a little bit of time. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the way you created us. If we peel it all back, you didn't need to create this biological order of things where we would create the people that, that come after us. But for some reason, that's your design and it seems good. And so, Father, we pray for those who are younger and still vulnerable. Give us the wisdom, Father, to know how to protect and when to protect, but also to know when to release and let them stumble and let them learn. Lord, help us to protect them from the, the lies and the schemes of the world, but at the same time, Lord, I pray that we don't bubble wrap them and, and stop them from growing up and learning about what life is all about. As we gather right now and as we pray individually and together, Father, I pray that our children will be blessed, the children of this congregation. Let's just take a moment and pray together. Again, if you feel compelled, stand and pray where you're at. Father, we thank you for the gift of children, the new life, children of new life. Lord, we pray for wisdom uh, to know uh, how to lead, how to care for our kids. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, one of the things I had written a note about is to, and maybe this is homework for you, prayer homework. Um, keep in mind Timberline Ranch. I know we've gone through a season of COVID where you probably haven't been out there very often, but I know a lot of us, we've got some people with some rich history at Timberline. Um, but Timberline is a, a, a faith-based cowboy camp. Can I call it that? That That's pretty good. Does that actually sound, makes it sound really cool, doesn't it? Um, but uh, keep in mind Timberline. Be praying for, for Craig and, um, and the crew out there. All right. I had written down that I was going to do some more announcements or elaborate on yours. I'm not going to. Um, a, because of time, but you did a great job. Good job. 
All right, today we are carrying on in Luke. We were in Luke 18 last week. We're in Luke 19 this week, but you will notice we have skipped some along the way. Today we've, we've, this we've actually orchestrated and choreographed to get to this point where today we're teaching about the triumphal entry of Jesus, where he's walking, or actually not walking, entering into Jerusalem. And, and it's kind of, we're getting to the climax of the story of the life of Jesus. But coming out of Luke 18, there's some things to consider. And, and with if you can remember what we were teaching on last week, and now we get into the very beginning of Luke 19, and you don't need to do anything, Josiah, because I, I actually added this to my message this morning. So, um, so the, the part about Zacchaeus is in the very first part of Luke 19. And those of you who know who Zacchaeus was and who grew up in the church are probably singing the fact that Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Uh, I relate to Zacchaeus in my shortness, and, uh, but I can't relate to him in his wealth. Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector of the land. And, and we've actually been talking a little bit about the tax collectors. Uh, remember last week we had um, the Pharisee praying, thank God I'm not like the tax collector. And the reason he would have prayed that is the tax collectors were despised. They were essentially traitors and rats to their own people. And they got fat and happy doing that. Very wealthy. And this was the chief. This was like the godfather of tax mafia, uh, Zacchaeus. And, and so here we have this Zacchaeus in Jericho. And Jesus is really, he's making his last um, foray towards Jerusalem. And passing through Jericho. And he has this moment. Uh, again, this is at the height of his popularity in min ministry. His popularity for different reasons. Some people can't get over his teaching. Can't get enough of his teaching. And some people are just looking for an excuse to have him strung up or crucified. And so with this as a backdrop, you see this huge crowd of people swarming around him. And Zacchaeus being a wee little man, he wanted to see this Jesus that he's heard so much about. And so we, we read that he climbs into the sycamore tree to get a better view and to see what this Jesus is doing. And when he does it, Jesus spots him. And Jesus calls him by name and says, hey, I'm going to your house right now. Take, take me to your house. We're going to have a meal. We're going to hang out together. And so I don't know how amazing it was, if it was a prophetic understanding and discernment that he knew his name, or if Zacchaeus was, was well known as the tax collector. I don't know either way. But regardless, another thing he was well known for was being a man that was despised by everybody. The Jews hated him because he was crooked and, and took more than he was supposed to from them in taxes. The Romans hated him because they didn't respect a guy who would turn his back on his nation like that and get rich off of his people's back. Nobody liked the Zacchaeus. And so when Jesus called out to Zacchaeus, oh, I'm, I'm coming to your house. There was this murmuring in the crowd, probably by everybody. Like, what? I thought this Jesus was special. Why would he go to the home of a sinner. And perhaps they hadn't read the chapters before where Jesus does this over and over and over again. But they would have been blown away probably for two reasons. A, that like, I thought Jesus had this prophetic insight into people's lives. How can he not see this in his heart, the brokenness and the dirtiness of this Zacchaeus? And two, why would he go there when he could go to a nice person's home? But we see this um, we see this duality in how Jesus is received. Or uh, actually, we see that in the next part where we see that some people were murmuring and grumbling against Jesus. That was their response. But do you remember what Zacchaeus' response was? And sorry that I don't have the notes up on the screen. He was full of joy. But the other thing he was full of was repentance. So we see, actually, we saw in, in Luke 18, just last week, this interaction with Jesus and the rich young ruler. Do you remember that? Where he, he explained that, you know, I follow the law perfectly. And he outlined these relational laws that he, he's not a murderer. He's not an adulterer. He's, he's done the law well. But he wants to know how he can earn his way to heaven. And Jesus tells him, sell everything you got and follow me. And he left full of sorrow because he couldn't do it. He couldn't give up. His wealth. His wealth was on the throne of his life. 
His wealth was what he had his trust in and his faith in. And he couldn't give it up to put God on the throne. Zacchaeus was starkly different. Zacchaeus was invited into relationship with Jesus. His response was, I'm going to fix all of my crookedness. And the people that I've ripped off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay them back extra. It was like he was walking in sin towards death. And Jesus got a hold of his life. And he's like, I'm walking a different way now. And everything about that past life, I'm doing differently. I'm going to walk differently. He was full of repentance and joy. So we see on one side, we see the people murmuring. That's their response to Jesus going to see Zacchaeus. And then on the other side, we see Zacchaeus' response. His response of repentance and joy. All right, well, that comes, that brings us to the part where we do have the text. So this is Luke 19. We're going to pick up in verse 28. And I'm only going to get to the first part before we do a little talking. So verse 28 goes like this. After Jesus has said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And this might just sound like it's setting the scene, but there's something important and powerful that's happening here. Jesus is walking to Jerusalem knowing full well what is awaiting him there. If I knew with 100% assurance that by driving back to my home today, I would be robbed and killed, I would probably not drive home, right? Like I would, I would alter my course and go somewhere different. Jesus knew not only that he was going to see his life end in Jerusalem, he knew that it was going to be brutal. He knew the physical, emotional, and spiritual pain that he was headed towards. And sometimes I think, uh, I, I, I've got to be honest, I love, um, is it Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ? Is that what it's called? Uh, I love the emotion that that stirs up in me. It makes it very real to me. But sometimes I'm guilty of, of watching that and thinking, oh, poor Jesus. Like, oh, no. And I have, I have pity for him. And I feel like he has something is happening to him. But this verse gives us this picture that Jesus is walking voluntarily. He is giving himself to this. He is going in fully aware, totally knowing what is coming, and he is giving himself to this. You'll hear me say this a lot when we talk about this. Jesus was never a victim. He walked in, and we're about to see, he walked in triumphantly to his death. He marched into his death. Johannes Geldenheis. I don't know. Uh, Rich, how was my, my, I don't know how. Beautiful, thank you. Um, he writes, at last, Jerusalem. The temple city in which the greatest and holiest drama on earth will be staged the following week is in immediate vicinity. You, you need to have in mind the spiritual crescendo that we are, it's, there's this swell towards the end. And now Jesus has arrived. And so he's still outside of Jerusalem when this stuff happens. So let's pick up now again in verse 29. As he, appro uh, excuse me, as he approached Bethphage, and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. So again, we see Jesus walking carefully and deliberately. And, and what you might not understand is in, in the background, Jesus is fulfilling these prophetic, messianic prophetic words. I don't know if I say that right. These, uh, the, the prophecies, messianic prophecies about him by making these arrangements to ride in on a colt. He had been to Jerusalem many times before. But as he entered this time, there was something special. There was something different. And he's being very careful and deliberate about the way he's entering Jerusalem. He says, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Now, Jesus rode this relatively humble animal into Jerusalem. Instead of coming on this horse as a conquering general, 
he came on a colt. And, but this was actually a custom of royalty. If you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, Morris says this. And I chose this quote purely because it says ass several times. It goes like this. The, the ass was the mount of a man of peace, a merchant or a priest. A king might ride an ass on occasion, but he would be more likely to appear on a mighty war horse. Zechariah's prophecy saw Messiah as the prince of peace. So there's something very deliberate. I actually had to do a little digging about the difference between a donkey and, and oh, I know about the difference between a donkey and a horse, but what donkey and, and colt and all of you farmers know that I'm, I'm not that bright, but I learned that a foal is a foal up. So a, a baby donkey is called a foal up to a year. A colt is less than four years, I guess o older than one year, but less than four years, unless it's a female, then it's a filly. Did you know that? Now you're smarter. There you go. And so um, I don't know if Ryan Douglas is here or if he's teaching, but his favorite team is the Colts, and so now we know they're donkeys. All right? <laughs> Please make sure to tell him I said that. All right. All right. Verse 35 says this. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount, Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now, just as we saw two very different responses to Jesus when we looked at the story of Zacchaeus, we see two very different responses to Jesus in this moment of entering um, Jerusalem. We have one group of people who honor Jesus extravagantly. And these people were this wake of people who had experienced forgiveness. I don't know if all of them had, but they've seen his mighty works and they've heard the gospel message and they are identifying him as the king. And they are just in awe of him. They're in love with him. And they can't get enough. They can't honor him highly enough. And then we've got another group. We hear that um, the Pharisees say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now the crowd's praise made the enemies uncomfortable. It was like, how, how are they giving him this much honor? They didn't get it. Where the common lay people were worshiping the king of kings. The people who studied the law and were waiting patiently for the Messiah. Were saying, you got to shut them up. They can't talk about you like this. And it was like there was this blindness to who this Jesus was. The very people who should have been the most prepped. The most ready for a Messiah to come. This was the person. This was the one. They had been waiting for all of these years. And now when he's in their presence, he, they're saying to him, you can't let them worship you like this. It's wrong. It made them uncomfortable. It made them also know that they were being defeated. Because the other thing that characterized this group is they were working against Jesus, just looking for an opportunity to have him finished and maybe see the end of his life come to pass. John 12, 19 says that on this day, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They are having this dawning realization that they have lost in the PR battle with Jesus. And where Jesus at one point, remember when he would we'd do the miraculous and he would heal somebody, he'd say, don't tell anybody. It's, it's not time yet for people to realize, to know fully what is going on here and who I am. Now he's saying, it's time. Let's take the blinders off. Let's show the world who I am and whose I am. And it's at this same time that the, the Pharisees who've been rallying against Jesus and who are literally plotting his death, they realize we've lost. We've lost this war over 
Jesus' reputation. We've tried to under, undercut him. We've tried to point out how when he heals, he's healing on the Sabbath sometimes. And he's, he's fraternizing with sinners. And they've tried to soil his reputation, but he, they've lost. The people are in love with this Jesus. And I love Jesus' response. I tell you that even if these people were to keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. This was a time when Jesus was going to be worshipped, was going to be praised. And, and I think this is true of a lot of things. I think this is more broadly applicable than in this moment. That God loves to use us, but God is independent of it. He doesn't need us. I think he wants to use us. And even in this moment, if every person would have missed the point and would not have been worshiping Jesus, I think God would have, I think, literally called his creation to sing the praises and shout about who this was that was entering Jerusalem. Um, I think I'm going to go on. You know what? This is it. Actually, don't go on just yet. Sorry, Josiah. Pump faked you there. Uh, I'm going to read my notes here. With a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, their praise was filled with remembrance. This is something I'd never really thought about before. The, the praise of the people, you can almost see this, this journal or diary of them remembering all of the things that this Jesus has done. And, and they, were, they were kind of like, they were giving him praise for what he had done. They had no idea what he was about to do. They were going to get their minds blown, probably their hearts broken and their minds blown. But their praise was stemming from what he had done up to this point. And that word remembrance triggered, we normally would be doing, we'd be sharing communion on first Sunday of the month. We're going to do that on Friday. So at our Good Friday services, we'll be sharing communion. But communion is all about remembering what he's done. Now we have the benefit of, of living farther in the future. And so we see how this story rolls out. When we talk about what Jesus has done, there's a lot more of the story that these people don't even know about yet. They're just worshiping for what he's been doing here on earth up until this point, And they don't even know what's still to come. But we do. And so when we share communion, we remember in that way. And it should be a time that fills us with joy and reverence for who he is. All right, verse 45 says this. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. You guys are going to start to recognize this part of the story. And it's a transition from the entrance. Now he has entered. And he says, it is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Each day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, priests the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because of all the people. They just hung on his words. I, I want to camp for just a little bit in here. And I hope that I don't over apply what is happening in this moment. But I think that what Jesus does here is a picture of his character and his will for us. So he goes and he starts cleansing the temple. See, if, if you could imagine the temple being like this, almost like this open space where people would come and before Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice by, by dying on the cross for our sins, the way that you could be forgiven for your sins, it still required a blood sacrifice. Again, Jesus paid the ultimate blood sacrifice. But before that, there was a whole system of sacrifices set up. And so if you wanted to be cleansed for your sin, there was a whole ceremony and, and ritual that needed to happen, and you needed to have the, the animals to sacrifice. And so some enterprising Jewish fellows decided, hey, they need these animals to sacrifice. We could grow, grow, farm, farm, farm these animals, bring them to this, this place of worship, and we could make a profit selling it to the people who don't have their own animals for sacrifice. And it may have felt noble providing a service for worship and offering and, and sacrifice. But it, it turned into, Jesus refers to this as a den of robbers, a den of thieves. 
much like Zacchaeus would have totally ripped off the people he was collecting taxes from, these people would have known that they've cornered the market on the animals that were needed for the sacrifice, and they jacked the prices. And, and it kind of makes, it kind of is a gross feeling, right? Thinking that people are profiting off of this salvation opportunity, this redemption uh, plan. But it, I, I think, and this is where I, I'm taking a bit of a chance, and there may be an, a little bit of an over-application. So chew on this. These are the words of David here. I think there's a lesson, and I think the reason Jesus is furious and cleared them all out isn't just because he doesn't like the look of people doing business in, in the temple. But what was happening is if a person was not wealthy enough, they couldn't afford the animal, they couldn't be redeemed. They couldn't have their sins forgiven. What these salespeople were doing, they were creating a barrier between people and their opportunity to be forgiven and to be made clean before the Father. They were creating a stumbling block. They were creating a, a hoop to go through or something to be stepped over, a barrier to be stepped over. And man, I think someday if we, when we stand before the Father, if we're guilty of saying to somebody, hey, you know what? If, if you really want to be loved by God, if you want to be a child of God, you need to dress the right way. Or you need to read from the right translation of the Bible. Or you need to give double a tithe. Or, or if, we, if we start to put any add-ons that are barriers beyond what is God's plan for our redemption, we are guilty of, of holding people back or potentially holding people back from knowing the Father. And God help us if that's true. And I, I don't think Jesus was going to stand for it. It's like, if you think you're going to come between my children or God's children and their father, you got nothing coming, for it, coming to you. And that's where he went in and he cleansed the temple. He wiped out those barriers. Church, this is something we're trying to be intentional about when you think about uh, our Spanish service, for example. Um, once upon a time, we had one Spanish family that was a part of this congregation, this, this 10 o'clock meeting. And they were great helping with our coffee. And we could have hoarded them and held on to them. But praise the Lord, God gave Edgar a word and said, I, I need to be doing more. I've, I've, I've come here with a purpose. I don't know what it is. And so we got him to start preaching. And, and what's happened there isn't just another service that spoke in another language. It is now an access point to people who would have had a barrier of language in this, in this place and other places like ours. Now that barrier has been removed. Church, we need to be about the barrier squashing business as opposed to the barrier building business. If you catch yourself adding qualifications to enter into the journey and the walk and the conversation of faith, uh, you're working against what I believe Jesus wants. All right. He talks about this is my house and this is, this is meant to be a house of prayer. And he talks about the purpose of, of the temple. This place of prayer was made into a marketplace and a dishonest one. It was working against the purpose of the temple. What the temple was meant for, and actually um, I'll be preaching at the Alliance Church on, on, on Friday, and uh, I'm going to preach a message that might be familiar to you as Northridgers, talking about God's pursuit of us. And a part of his pursuit of us is he, he didn't want to just kind of hang out in heaven and wait till we could get there. He made these overtures to come to us. And one of those ways was the tabernacle, then the temple, where God's presence came to us. And so the temple was an important thing. And, and, and Jesus recognized that. He wanted to preserve the intent of this place. This is a place to come before the, 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 our God. And it shouldn't be just a den of thieves, or shouldn't be a den of thieves. Um, let me scoot over to a quote, Josiah. Um, this is by William Barclay. It says, In that uproar of buying and selling and bargaining and auctioneering, prayer was impossible. Those who sought, sought God's presence were being debarred from it by the very people of God's house, house. So again, what was meant to be was not being used the proper way. 
Um, you know what? I'm going to invite the worship team up now. I'm just going to finish this last little bit here. And he was teaching daily in the temple. After running the merchants out of the temple courts, Jesus boldly continued his work of public teaching and healing. He was able to continue because the people wanted to hear him. They were just hungry for the word. And, and even though there were these active plots to see Jesus crucified, he, his job was not yet done. He had teaching left to do. I'm going to read a little note. I've already kind of said this, but I, I, I wrote it so it's, it might have been important. It says, we're in the business of opening doors, not closing them. We, we're in the business of, of removing barriers, not building them. The work isn't easy. We've talked a lot over the last few days about denying ourselves, picking up our cross, about walking towards this narrow gate. And make no mistake, it is a narrow gate. But it's a, it's a wide open invitation. It's God's will that nobody would perish. And he makes a way for everybody that, that is interested in coming in and following this journey can walk towards this narrow gate. And it's so important that do we, we do our part to help people get on this path. All right, we've got a beautiful song to sing in response. I just want to invite you to stand. Let's sing together, and then I've got a blessing for you. Breathing my Savior all the day long. Amen. Normally I would keep you standing, but I'm going to ask you to have a seat. I believe I've got a word for you. Actually, a word's not the right idea. I think I have an idea, and I hope God turns it into the right word for you to receive. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit's going to do His thing. I, I think that we all have a response to Jesus. It happens innately. And, and sometimes we don't stay, take stock of the way we respond. I mentioned earlier a, a lower barrier opportunity that we've tried to create, and it sounds like we are so intentional. We fell into it, and God's doing his thing with the, the Spanish service. And in the same way, our story is we hadn't planned to start a Saturday night SNL kind of recovery focused service. It, it fell to us, and it's been a huge blessing. And one of the reasons it's a blessing is I get reminded, so I'm 50, almost 52 years old, and I was, became a Christian in the womb. I've, I've been a, a Christian, walked, walked the walk for a, a long time. And so sometimes I can lose sight of that Zacchaeus-like joy and moment of repentance. And one of the things I love about our Saturday night service is we get to see people sometimes come back to Jesus after a long journey. We get to see some people encounter Jesus for the first time. And it's almost like we get front row seats to see these people laying down the palm fronds and putting the, the blankets on the colt and worshiping Hosanna to the King of Kings. There's this, this beautiful, ripe moment of identifying Jesus as who he is. But the hard part is sometimes over time and, and, and life kind of wears on you and jades you a bit, um, I know I've been guilty of, of looking more like the Pharisees who are kind of like, well, they're, they're hardened to what's happening in the moment. And, and one of the characteristics of the Pharisees I think is most dangerous in a person like I've just described is they become really uh, evaluative. That's my non, I'm not trying to avoid the word judgmental. They, they become very evaluative of the situation. And they, and they survey what's going around them as opposed to understanding what's going on inside of them. I, I'm going to read a blessing in just a moment, but church, I, I feel we really need to take some time in our own lives and, and do some introspection, do some crying out to God, asking Him to hold up the mirror to us and to call out in us those, those times where we are more like the Pharisee than the forgiven. Where we sit back and we are evaluative of the things going on 
sometimes in our church community, sometimes in the lives of others. And in addition, we need to be seeking forgiveness for those times where we add different qualifications to people and expectations to people. They need to be a certain way if they're going to be with us. Because we're a mess. The, the thing that unites us in our messiness is the direction of our walk. We're walking toward that narrow gate. But we're still carrying baggage from our lives that we, we're hopefully going to let go of along the way so we can fit in that narrow gate. But really, that's God's work. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's not for us to sit here in our Pharisee-like Pharisee our Pharisee state and, and look at how much baggage other people are going. I'm going far too far down the rabbit hole of this metaphor. All right, hopefully, you know what? Let me pray first, and then I'm going to say a blessing. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would interpret the word that you have for our people through your Holy Spirit into the hearts and minds of everybody here, that you would translate into our individual lives the word that we need to receive from you right now in this moment, and that we would, we would take that and we would port that with us outside of this building, and we would put it into action, whether that action is self-reflection or if it's just a, a, a deeper tethering to you, Whatever you're calling us to, Lord, I pray that you would call us clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I have a blessing for you. May our response to Jesus be repentance and joy. And let us work to provide a place and an opportunity for others to find that repentance and joy. Bless you, and we'll see you hopefully Friday. Um, no, before that, hopefully tonight yeah, at Northside up on the hill. All right, bless you. No, is that right? Northside up on the hill, see you tonight. Goodbye.